this. The water in this little Japanese film is, is cycling. Right? And it gradually fills up and fills up and fills up until you get enough in there, hopefully. Ah, oh, yeah, there it goes. <laughs> okay, this is called a shishio doshi. And I, uh, my friend Bela Novak pointed out this nice little this little thing. So it's very simple. That's, that's the oscillator. But that's, not, of course, not very clear how it controls the cell cycle. In fact, the shishi yodoshi does not control the cell cycle. It's, it's a garden ornament. <laughs> okay, so this thing is a protein kinase. No question about that. And it phosphorylates, for example, histone H1 and lots of other things. And the question is, you know, as far as we know, protein kinases work by phosphorylating things. So the question is, you know, how many proteins do you have to phosphorylate? How much in order to get a cell to enter mitosis? And this turns out to be a miserable kind of question. It's a very obvious question to ask, but it's a very difficult question to answer. And over the years, I and many other people have uh, tried to to answer this question, and this is our sort of, we've stopped trying to do it because it's so boring, because you get this list of substrates and it really doesn't help you understand the control of anything whatsoever, because there's just a random list. In fact, it conforms very much to what Sidney Brenner has called low input, high throughput, no output <laughs> research, <laughs> which is very much, uh, and he, he, he doesn't, he's a bit scornful about most systems biologists because of this. Um, and then, when you start to think about it, of course, um, we haven't really explained anything, especially about the end of mitosis, because, okay, cycling proteolysis turns the protein kinase off, fine, but that's not enough. You've got to take all the phosphates that you just put on, you've got to take them all off again. I mean, we don't know that for sure, but surely it sort of... You know, it doesn't, you don't need a training in biochemistry hardly to suspect that that must be the case. So what do we know about the phosphatases? And the answer is extremely little, and the literature is almost silent on the subject, and what literature there is, um, is rather contradictory. Some people say PP1 is the really important phosphatase, and some people say that PP2 is the really important phosphatase, and it depends whether you're a biochemist or a yeast geneticist as to which one you believe. So that's, that's, that's not great. And the only thing I say about this, I was asked to give a plenary lecture at a protein phosphatase meeting because they knew that protein phosphorylation and CDKs were important for cell cycle control. So protein phosphatases must be important. Now, I hadn't done any experiments on protein phosphatases, so it's kind of difficult to give a plenary lecture on something which you knew nothing about. Um, but I did say that I thought that probably the protein phosphatases that were important must be switched off in mitosis because otherwise you would get futile cycles and you couldn't phosphorylate things properly. And then I never, I never put a postdoc or a graduate student or tried to do any experiments on it myself. And that would have been in about 1989 or 1990. Until uh, this chap came along. This is Satoru who's just gone back to Japan. And he's a very... It, it, it turned out he's absolutely a wonderful biochemist and I, also a wonderful person, and I've really, really tremendously enjoyed working with him. I mean, I, 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 it seems to me in my life that my happiest times as a scientist have always been when I've been working with one or two other people with whom I sort of got on very well. I mean, really quite an intense relationship, almost like a love affair, really. I mean, you know, that you're sort of both working or the little tiny group, and I, I don't really like sort of big groups of people because things tend to get out of control and you don't know what's going on at the edges. So with Satoru, it was really sort of wonderful because I can't do experiments anymore and I'm much too busy, but Satoru was very good and we'd, we'd just discuss things and it was terrific. You'll see. So the system that uh, he wanted to come and work with, he was a, trained as a yeast person in Mitsuhiro Yanagida's lab was this. You take these frog eggs, which I've mentioned already, and you spin them. Actually, this is the second spin. The first spin would have about half the tube would be filled with this black stuff that comes from here. Second spin, this yellow layer here is beautiful, pure cytoplasm, completely undiluted. And it contains things like mitochondria and various sort of uh, vesicular things as well. 
And it was shown very beautifully, especially by Andrew Murray, um, that in this system, uh, you, can, you can monitor the cell cycle by adding nuclei. I'll show you that in, 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 in a second. Um, and he, Andrew showed that the only thing you need to make in this system, new protein, is cyclin, and that will actually drive repeated cell cycles. And you can usually tell, I mean, here uh, you're going to see a lot of these kind of assays where the protein undergoes a little mobility shift because when the protein kinase is finally turned on, you get a rather clean shift in this particular thing. And there are other, other, other markers that work in a similar way. Okay? So that's the, that's the system. Now, I need, now need to uh, explain just a little bit about this bit, this prolonged arrest in M phase. It's actually second meiosis, which occurs until the sperm arrives. And uh, in common with, as far as I know, all um, fertilization events, um, the way the sperm works is to catalyze a big release of calcium inside uh, the recipient egg. So it's a calcium flash that causes the MPF to turn off and trigger cyclin proteolysis. Okay, so what is CSF and why? Well, again, this is pretty amazing. This is a rather simple switch mechanism. And it's taken a hell of a long time to work out the details. We now understand it reasonably well. The first great breakthrough came in 1989 when uh, Nori Sagata Japanese postdoc with George Vandervoort found that the C. mosonka gene was CSF. And to cut a long story short, it turns out that CMOS is at the top of a MAP kinase cascade. And down at the bottom of the cascade is a protein called ERP1, which inhibits the ubiquitin ligase that degrades cyclin. Okay. So that's fine. That imposes a cell cycle arrest. You can't degrade the cyclin. You stay forever. And then how does calcium work? Well, calcium turns on a protein kinase, which in, by a very complicated procedure leads to the destruction of that inhibitor. So the ERP1 disappears and uh, everything goes on. So we wanted to understand how that inhibitor worked because at the time we were studying the ubiquitin ligase and its control. Uh, so Satoru made this construct here where you take away the phosphodegron that leads to the degradation of ERP1. So this is now indestructible GST ERP1. This is the business end of the molecule that inhibits uh, the ubiquitin ligase. And he added it into the extract and tested whether it worked. And he came to me and showed me that it worked because when you added calcium normally, cyclin gets degraded. And when you add this stuff in, cyclin doesn't get degraded. And he came with a big smile on his face and said, look, it works. Now we can proceed. Great. But he also included this blot here, one of the APC subunits. And you can see that this is one of those proteins that in mitosis is more or less totally, it's about 95% shifted up, and in interphase it 100% shifts down. So you're going to see a lot of these assays. We use this band shift assay as a marker for whether an extract is in M phase or interphase. And what we noticed was that when you added the calcium, transiently, APC, not 100% shifts down, but it sort of goes down, you know, and then went back up again because we haven't degraded the cyclin, so we haven't turned off the kinase. The kinase stays on but there must be a phosphatase which is activated in there. And there's really only one possibility for what that phosphatase is. It must be the calcium-activated phosphatase. And uh, so it is. So when Satoru did the assay, indeed, there's a spike of phosphatase activity, uh, which is calcineurin. Um, and its name means that it's a calcium-binding protein that you find in the brain, calcineurin, right? It was some time before it was discovered that it was actually a protein kinase. And um, this cyclosporin A, of course, is an immunosuppressive drug.